I am um, AKA the Roti Queen. Um, and uh, one day I'll tell the story behind the name, um, but it's something um, everybody, many of my colleagues uh, and close friends and all of my social media accounts um, have that name. Uh, thank you. Let me just thank all of you um, at um, the South African Institute for, for, for Civil Engineers um, and a, a special word of thanks to the president. And I think um, it's worth noting that the president of, um, of, of the institute is a female and an accomplished um, female at that. Uh, just listening to her was uh, really phenomenal. And I think um, not only does she have experience of the industry, but also the experience of, of business. Um, and I think um, her words of wisdom, definitely for anybody wanting to just um, delve into the space of running your own business, um, those words of wisdom would definitely take you very, very far. Because I think um, some of the aspects that she spoke about are some of what we see in the industry and from government side as, um, as reasons behind uh, business failure. So thanks so much to you, um, Program Director. And again, thank you. Uh, let me just acknowledge the President, um, um, as well as our fellow speakers, uh, Mr. Mklanga and, and Zinit. Um, and then um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, especially those who are on the, on the um, have connected um, onto the platform. Um, especially spending a Thursday evening. Um, it's afternoon. I hear, heard the band say uh, afternoon, afternoon, and I was like, no, no. And then I remembered, okay, yes, they are in Cape Town, so the sun sets a bit late there. Um, but yeah, to take out um, time from your busy schedules on a Thursday evening, uh, which is generally should be um, family time, um, but you have all taken out um, these this two hours just to set aside. Um, for this um, for this purpose. So good evening to all of you. Um, and um, really, it's an honor to address um, address you during Women's Month. Um, and, you know, um, Mr. Mshanga said that August, it can't just be August, that's Women's Month. And I think for me, that always hits home. Um, often we hear during the women's, during the month of women, um, some of the irritation that women do share with us and I think I share that irritation is that we get invited, we eat a lot, uh, we get invited to a lot of events, we get a lot of um, attention, um, a lot of um, um, a lot of eventing happens in August. Um, but what we really should be interested in is what is the sustainable work and what are the deliverables that we are able to achieve outside of just August throughout the year. And we should possibly use um, the month of August going forward to be able just to report back and say, look, since the last time we met, at, with this is what we've been able to do. This is what we've not been able to do. This is where we need help. Um, this is where we need your intervention. Um, but um, an ode to a very remarkable woman um, who we are celebrating and have, um, have dedicated this year to. And she is really the mother of Black Freedom, <clears throat> Mayor Charlotte Makweke. Despite her many achievements, all of which are widely known, she unfortunately died in poverty. Um, the contribution of Mesh Charlotte to the emancipation of us will forever remain etched in our hearts. History will indeed judge her very kindly. And coincidentally, my, part, my department is seized with repairs to the second largest hospital in the country, which is named after this, this woman. And I think it's an opportunity for us to really uh, pay homage to her, um, to make sure that the facility, um, of course, given the unfortunate event that took place, but it's an opportunity for us to ensure that that facility is given a fresh new lease on life and um, is able to really honor the woman that it is named after. Our work there continues and we're scheduled to deliver the refurbished hospital in 2022-23. Um, and I think um, I'm often wary of committing to a date. As we all know, the construction industry is one of the most unpredictable spaces to work in. Um, you can plan and plan and plan, and then something happens that affects the industry either directly or indirectly, the same way COVID has, um, and everything has an impact on the industry, and then your plans just, um, just go up in smoke. Um, so we're hoping that's not going to happen, and we do hope that at least by the end, by 2022-23, we'll be able to have the, 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 the hospital fully refurbished, 100% operational. 
Um, today, we gathered virtually um, due to the prevailing pandemic that also continues to hinder the economic recovery, as well as to bring untold damage to many sectors. Um, and as we heard previously, just, um, just reflecting on the impact and the negative impact and the effects that COVID has had on the economy and to an industry, um, which is the construction industry, which is just really a subset of, of the built environment. Um, that was really ailing even before um, uh, COVID and COVID really just knocked it um, to its knees. Um, ours is definitely one of those that have been so badly affected. Um, you know, I was just sitting with somebody today who was saying that we can't decide whether to proceed with development or not, because if we do, um, we are going to have a lot of our um, capital um, locked in a project for a period of uh, possibly between four to five years. And with the uncertainty in the economy, we're not really sure whether we can afford that. So we'd rather perhaps look at other alternatives and opportunities for, 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 for return on investment, as opposed to a long, a medium to longish term investment. So I think even people with capital, um, albeit uh, few and far between, are even grappling with those decisions whether to invest, whether to not, whether to develop, whether to not. Um, so I think without belaboring really how much um, COVID has damaged uh, the economy, impacted uh, um, just the ability of government to be able to do work, to be able to respond. Um, I think in the same breath, I want to say that all is not lost. In every crisis, crisis, it is those with vision and foresight to identify opportunities for growth and innovation. For starters, technology has allowed us to gather in, technology has allowed us to continue working. And there are things though that still require certain skills that not even the best artificial intelligence systems can provide. One of those is hope. So hope is a human design and a gift that can turn ashes into greatness. Hope is what is left once the raging fires have died out. Whatever we do, may we not lose hope. And through all our efforts as individuals and a collective, we will prevail in the end. With this message, I hope all of us who have lost loved ones, friends, relatives, and colleagues to this pandemic be comforted. I too am one of them. So really what we want to be able to share with the, with yourselves um, in this um, in this session is just what are the opportunities? Um, what are the opportunities from the department perspective and from the public public sector perspective really? And also what have I and um, with my team, working with my team, what has been our experience in the past two years? And what have been our observations? Um, what, what have been those observations? Um, Stats has released, um, Stats A has released research recently that reported that manufacturers of basic iron and steel, non-ferrous metal products and metal products and machinery increased their output by 19.2%, contributing 3.5 percentage points increase. Um, stakeholders in the sector welcome the improvement in metals and engineering production and sales is encouraging as it indicates the economy is slowly gaining momentum despite the COVID pandemic. All pointers are showing a steady improvement. I believe, I think these types of stats must, must excite um, civil engineers in particular. Um, a lot has been done and the road ahead is beckoning, demanding that we fight on and continue on the work that our forebears have, have, have put out and have done. I'm a product of a political party that recognizes the importance of implementing government, um, of being an implementing government that seeks to give women their rightful place in leadership positions. I lead a department that is predominantly male, um, even from an employment point of view, not only just the sector itself, and um, but it is still run by men and one that is not transforming fast enough. On Mondays, um, as much as I can, um, so let me just put a disclaimer, uh, because it started off as a Monday program, but um, like I said, um, all things being equal, you can plan and plan and plan, and then something happens and your plans just uh, go to pot. So um, Mondays I had initially dedicated to spend my time on site um, where I inspect projects that we are busy with on behalf of various clients in government. So DID, Department of Infrastructure Development, is the implementing department uh, for social infrastructure in the, product, in the province. Um, and many of the professional service providers, including civil engineers, are men, yet there are a few that are women. The picture is changing, but still not fast enough. And definitely um, not the demographic, not only just women, but I think even um, the previously disadvantaged demographic that we want to see. Um, it's, just not, it's just not quick enough. Um, and especially if somebody is impatient, and I think uh, many of us are, 
We do want to see transformation happening rapidly, um, something that we can touch and feel all the time. Um, the contractors are largely also male dominated, especially those with higher grading, um, CIDB grading, so either nine, eight, even up to seven. Um, and the, 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 it, in fact, myself, I've only dealt with one female contractor out of more than 30 projects. Um, we are trying to address that. And I think um, some of the aspects that, um, that was spoken about earlier was just about why is it that, um, that businesses fail? And I mean, um, you know, just the, the, the fact that in the, in the first five years of a business life, you either will fail or will succeed. And, um, and a lot, we do see that they are able possibly to get up to a grade five or a six, um, six CIDB grading, and then are just not able to progress beyond that. Um, so what is, what is part of the problems? Um, unfortunately, it points to the slow pace of gender transformation in the built environment. And I think from my own perspective, um, you know, there's always, um, there's always the reality that women have got to make decisions between competing priorities. So for me to run a business, um, I've got to um, compete and think about, um, will I be at the office? Uh, will I be on site? Or am I going to uh, raise a family? Am I going to have children? Um, how am I going to raise that family? How am I going to raise my children? Um, if I'm expected to be on site um, for a remarkably long period of time, um, you know, and we always, we've always got to make decisions between competing priorities. Uh, those priorities are not only women, and I think um, we must understand that those priorities are equally men's priorities, but um, ultimately it's women that grapple with, the, with, with competing between those. Men often don't, and able to make decisions on their own, um, which will see them progressing and growing much quicker, much faster, and much further than, than their female counterparts. Um, I do believe that femi feminism can only thrive if we deliberate about empowering and supporting women in every way possible. We have more than capable female leaders. They just need necessary support in order to participate in strategic positions and make a meaningful contribution to the economy in all sectors. And I'm often asked, how, how, did, I do, uh, what, how did I do what I've done? And how do I continue to do what I do? And a big part of it is just having a very good, strong support structure. And it's not necessarily, and it doesn't always have to be your family and your blood, relatives, et cetera, um, but a support structure that is able to support you throughout your journey and to be able to support the decisions that you make for your own development is very, very key to being able to do what you want to do and to continue to do it. For us, there are, as a department, a lot of opportunities uh, in, uh, for, in upcoming projects, and I'm going to speak about the opportunity is not um, gender specific, but I think it's something that um, if women are aware of um, specifically, they can also adequately prepare to be able to place themselves in a very um, good position to, to participate and take up those opportunities. So for us, we are going to undertake the biggest government accommodation project since 2010 in the form of the Kopano Increasing Project. It is the biggest triple P um, that has yet been delivered, um, yet to be delivered by government um, since the dawn of, of democracy. And this is going to see um, all head office accommodation of the provincial government accommodated in buildings that are owned by ourselves. Um, that is Gauteng Provincial Government. Um, we are already ahead with the project offices and the project unit, um, the project management unit, which has started to work. Um, we are, are concluding the, the bidding and the procurement phases and the negotiations with the private partners. And we are on track to start um, with that refurbishment work um, early in 2022. Um, the city of Johannesburg is a key role player in this. And they are, as a result of this, going to experience an upgrade in the property value in the Johannesburg CPD. More than this, there are many sectors that are going to benefit from the Kopanong Precinct project. And I think I said, I did reflect that construction is a subset of the, of the built environment industry. And they are um, the professionals and the, our heavy, heavy reliance on professionals and such as yourselves on the platform. And then there is the manufacturing and the supply of the materials, which is a huge opportunity that I think we just have not tapped, on, tapped into um, enough. And, and we've not been 
um, as, as, as vigorous and as aggressive to be able to attack the, the materials um, supply side of the built environment, but from a manufacturing aspect. So for quite some time now, Gauteng Province has needed an intervention through which its economic and infrastructure fortunes will be elevated to a globally coordinated level for high impact in our communities. However, this has, was hampered to a certain degree by uncoordinated planning and implementation of the infrastructure programs by various service delivery arms of government, where the plans did not talk to, and talk to each other. This has unfortunately affected the speed of delivery given the massive resources collectively invested by all spheres of government. And here I'm speaking about the local authority, the provincial government, national governments. And of course, at local authorities, you even have different dis dispensations for a local municipality, a district municipality, and a metropolitan municipality. So it makes that planning just, just a bit more cumbersome and just more complicated. But I think um, it, it's, it, it's worth um, just familiarizing yourselves with the district development model that really seeks to just pull everything together what should happen in a, in a geographic space, um, whether it's done by implemented by national, provincial, or the local, um, local municipalities. Um, I think for us, uh, we, we found that um, the, the, the role players and stakeholders in the infrastructure space also had difficulty of working with different public bodies in helping address the needs of the same communities. Um, so the communities have got various needs, and then you find that in one street, um, there are three different um, spheres of government that are responsible for different aspects. And communities don't often understand that. They just understand, they just want a service to be delivered. They want a project to be implemented. And then you find, for instance, the land will be owned by um, national government. Services must be um, delivered by the municipality and top structures by provincial government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So even our own coordination and the legal framework that we work under and work within doesn't necessarily support even the way the industry um, is designed. And I think that's something that I've always spoken about is that even um, if you look at the Public Finance Management Act, it doesn't necessarily support the industry. Uh, and um, I could have a whole session just on uh, the PFMA and how it actually hinders um, uh, the, the, the industry, built environment industry to perform. Um, so, so we've committed in the sixth administration, um, which was the beginning, beginning 2019, 2020, um, to put 60 billion of our own, 60 billion rand of our own uh, funding towards infrastructure development over a five year period. So that means roads, housing, um, and then social infrastructure, the, the, the kind that we are um, responsible for, for, as the department is responsible for implementing. Um, and I think for, and for us, it was an exciting um, time because we were then tasked to implement the entire infrastructure program on behalf, on behalf of the province. And it started with developing what we call the five-year project pipeline. Um, so what we've done is uh, we've pulled together everything from all municipalities, from um, national departments, even from SOEs, just to say, what is it that you plan to do? Have you budgeted for it? Are they um, uh, sod ready? Uh, how far are those projects? Can we call it a project? Is it a concept? Um, and then we're able to just put together the five-year project pipeline to say that um, we're no longer going to we're no longer going to have pet projects, which I think has also been a very big problem in government. Um, somebody comes and because I'm from Benoni, yes, I am, proudly so, I still live in Benoni um, and it's right next to Brackpan, yes, yes, yes. Um, but I enter office and what happens is um, the community of Benoni have wanted something for a very long time and then what I do, I stop everything and go and address the, the community of Benoni's needs. Um, that, and it becomes a pet project, um, does it, is it, is it, is it feasible? Has it taken into consideration planning, budgeting, all of those things? So the project pipeline um, is really an attempt to say that we will publish um, what it is the five-year infrastructure plan of the province. And it is the blueprint that um, regardless of who comes in and out of, of office will be implemented. So what that does is really, it gives confidence to the private sector of government plans 
It allows the private sector to be able to plan accordingly because you know what is government plans. You also know that um, these are budgeted for, they are here, there, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also, it also enables, it, it enables the industry as a whole. So whether it's the supply side of the materials, manufacturing, um, the construction companies uh, and the labor that goes into that or the professionals and the consultants to be able to plan and also to just align and identify opportunities up front so that opportunities are not um you're not you're not surprised by opportunities but they're well thought of well planned for um and they're predictable so it's it's really also founded on the comp on the principle of comprehensive land use needs in Gauteng communities and the in historic infrastructure backlog, and that speaks to all the backlog in totality: roads, um, the transport infrastructure, uh, transport itself, um, and then social amenities such as schools, clinics, hospitals, etc. And um, and for us, that is a very, 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 very critical thing because we need to be able to effectively and efficiently use our land because we are the smallest uh, province in the country um, in terms of land uh, mass. However, we are the most densely populated and every year we continue to get an influx of people who demand services, who um, put added strain and stress onto, onto governments um, already huge backlog that we've not been able to deliver over a period of time. For us, um, it's going to accelerate the delivery and tracking of schools, clinics, hospitals, uh, community centers, libraries, recreation facilities, other amenities in public, um, such as, for instance, even ECDs, um, early childhood development centers. And of course, we've indicated, um, uh, we've indicated what the amount is, the location and time frame of clusters of projects individual ones respectively. So you can have a look at the project pipeline if you're interested in what else education's plans, you can go through it. Um, you can look at in terms of geographic spread in the northern corridor of the province, what is education planning for, where, how many, what types of projects. We've also even just categorized them, new builds, refurbishments, renovations. So you're also able to see in, 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 in what spaces you want to play and um, all those opportunities, um, like I said, we rely on the private sector to be able to implement them, but it, we need the private sector to be ready to be able to implement them. Um, it's also going to serve as a key signpost and flagship of the contribution of Gauteng towards attainment of the goals of the National Development Plan towards 2030. I believe it's going to demonstrate the province's commitment to growing the economy and therefore inspire confidence in the private sector to come on board. Um, and I think one of the biggest gripes from the private sector has always been that we're not really sure of your plans as government. We're not even sure that you are planning. We just see things happening um, and you're not able as government to adequately um, communicate with the private sector um, to, as to what are you going to do? When are you going to do it? Um, at what scale? At what cost? You know, and 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 we've got to be able to work as a team because we, like I say, we just re we rely on the private sector to be able to implement. Um, for us, I think the biggest um, it, the biggest is just to address the spatial planning and the apartheid spatial planning in particular of the province. So we are going to give a lot of attention to the western um, the western corridor um, as it's known in the province and the southern corridor so that's out in the far um, where the contribution of previous drivers of economic activity such as mining um, in the west is um, as an example is just no longer available to create the required level of sustainable employment and trade so the re-energized indirect economic activities will give concrete evidence to those communities that the time for economic re revival has arrived um, it's also going to serve as a key indicator of the speed, temperament, and size of the construction and built environment in Gauteng. So ours, of course, is the largest. I think um, if we look just comparatively between ourselves and, and, and other provinces, um, what we put out to the market um, between 90 to 95% does get implemented. Uh, we hardly ever have cancellations. And if we do, we always, um, almost always have, have, have re-advertised. Um, we always, almost always have re-adverts and final appointments. So um, that level of, of predictability and that, that level of, 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 of concreteness in our plans also does give 
the private sector a lot of confidence in, in, in what actually comes out from, from Gauteng, um, our department specifically. And we're trying to get all other departments to also be able to stick to that so so that we able so that they're able to say look anything that comes out of Gauteng put out to the market is um, more than likely up to 90 percent going to get to the ground so so that we're also not treated with a lot of skepticism and saying oh they're going to cancel it etc cetera, etc cetera. so you've got to give confidence to the, the public sector to the private sector sorry for them to be able to contribute and put the, their money down in terms of of the investment um, so, so for us, we also want to, as the public sector, what we want to do with this is to crowd in public funding, public sector investment, um, so that we're not sort of doing small things everywhere, but we're able to redirect local authority, provincial, national government into one space at one time, um, so that we, we, we are able to, to really see the rent value of the investments. Uh, because if you're doing little things everywhere, at various times, um, you're not able to necessarily, um, the, the, the economy and the market is not able to really um, to see the benefit of the, the rent value that you are investing in an area. Um, so for us, that's, that's very important to bring all the public sector investment crowded in and fund um, social and economic infrastructure um, as one unit, as opposed to the many, the, the way we've been doing it. Um, so that's on the project pipeline. And I think, um, you know, like I say, for us, it's important to give confidence. Part of being con giving confidence to the private sector is to be predictable, is to communicate our plans, is to be able to be trusted with that communication of the plans. And that um, the plans are concrete, they are budgeted for, um, they have gone through the necessary um, project readiness matrices that, that are available. And so we know that um, whatever is put out into the market is definitely what the market will respond to. Because for us, um, I think a, a big hindrance is when, when, the, when the, the, the private sector and the market does not respond. Because when they don't, don't respond, it means that they don't have confidence um, in what we're doing. So when I took office exactly two years ago, one of the things I asked was what measures the department had put in place to develop young professionals. It was during this time that I met with them. Uh, so we have uh, candidate engineers, architects, quantity surveyors, project managers, town planners. Um, so we have candidates in the department. And I, re I did this really just to fully understand um, what was being done internally to advance their careers through opportunities and exposure. Not only that, I think having met them, I knew that we would have to create a lot more conducive environment for them to thrive and go on to achieve bigger things. I can proudly say this project is going well and some of the infrastructure you may have seen us deliver has been partly because of the participation and contribution of our young professionals. Many of them have started as candidates and through the exposure and the work that we, they are able to, um, to do through supervision of, of registered professionals, um, many of them have gone on to register. Um, so they start as, and I think that is very, very promising. And it's important for us to see somebody start at point A, but end at point B. It means that there is progress and it gives you um, some level of comfort that um, whatever you have done in terms of creating that conducive environment that um, Mr. Mklanga spoke about earlier is really um, is bearing fruit and results. Um, so for us, I think the, um, importantly, I think we can say that the public sector can do a whole lot more for young professionals. Um, we've got to be able to allow young, um, young professionals, candidates, to come ply their trade in, this, in the service of, of, of the built environment industry. And that can only be done through the different opportunities. Um, we've also got a graduate incubation program that we are about to start. Um, and um, I think I would be interested in some of your, your, your members that you, that you have um, who, are, who are graduates who have not yet um, registered as professionals or just candidates. Um, just to be able to come on board to, 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 to work with us, just to be able to, to get that exposure, the hours, the supervision, um, to allow them to be able to, to register. So that's some of the other opportunities that are available through what we do. Um, is just the professional and And for me, I think importantly is that if you have studied in the space, you've graduated, you now have a degree, 
um, it is important for you to be able to do a lot more. Um, so it is to seek opportunities, to be able to expose yourself, learn the differences between the public and the private sector, learn the differences between um, the, 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 the legislative frameworks that govern both, because I think that um, we can no longer, we, we live in an in a ever-changing environment. So we can no longer go to school, study, graduate, you get a degree, and that is your uh, career for all of your life until, until um, you retire. You've got to make yourself very flexible and very indispensable. And the only way to do that is to be able to empower yourself through knowledge and continuous professional development in the space. Because really you don't know necessarily where you, where you end up. Um, so I think, um, and where we're going to use the graduates um, in the, the graduate incubation program is on the OHS pro, um, upgrades. And that's on all 32 hospitals in the province. We've done condition assessments on all 32 hospitals. And we are starting with um, being able to, to, to attend to all those hospitals in terms of the, the OHS compliance. Um, so they, the opportunities there are for those who have graduated who are not yet um, registered. Um, I think for us, importantly, is that we've got to imagine a sector that supports women. Um, our 27-year-old democracy has made strides, yes, in the emancipation of women, but we all know industries built to serve one gender while leaving women in the periphery is lagging behind. Built environment and construction is one of them that is extremely male-dominated, um, and it's male-dominated in such a manner that um, the, the ceiling has remained so um, strongly intact um, that I often believe it's, it's, it's a concrete ceiling and not just glass and very, very difficult um, to break through. Uh, and I really can't, I think none of us can expect the sector to change on its own. So we've got to break down those barriers ourselves. And I think what you guys are doing is incredible, it's remarkable. Um, that is a start um, just to be able to share what, have, what, have, what has been your journey, what has been some of the things, um, the roadblocks that you've got to um, stay away from? What are the things that um, uh, that uh, that will make you really um, indispensable in the space? I think importantly is that we've got to understand that um, we, are, we are competing with some of the best in the world and um, professionals, uh, civil engineers um, have got to also hold, you've got to hold yourselves against the highest um, standards of the industry that the industry demands. And I think that's something that for me, I've seen uh, varies from, from company to company. So you could work with one company, excellent professionals who really take, um, you know, the, the, the fact that they have, that they have a, a PR registration um, to their name very, very seriously. And then you get those that just don't. And I think um, for us to remain competitive, for us to remain as, as, as robust as we are, and for us to remain um, as, as strong as we are as an industry, we rely on you who have graduated, who are registered, who are professionals in the space to maintain that high levels of professionalism, high levels of integrity, uh, because ultimately what you do for us and what you do for the built environment is about creating spaces where human beings um, will operate and reside in. And if you take it lightly um, that you, you do things in a way that doesn't stick to those standards, we are um, ultimately risking the lives of, of human beings and my conscience will not allow it and I hope that um, yours won't either. So ladies and gentlemen, um, for us, let's not be tired. I spoke about hope and I think that we can only live on hope. Um, if, we, if we don't have hope, we also cease to exist. And I think for us, we've got to just not stop in our quest for equal, equal opportunities in everything that we do. Uh, for young people in particular to, um, to just uh, kick out um, the old and the dying. Uh, for, for young people, because we see the tomorrow because we will be part of that tomorrow. Um, others will not see it because um, they know that they're not going to be there. So whatever you want to inherit, you've got to create it today. And I think that um, for us, um, we've got to use that agency in a very positive manner. Uh, definitely, we're not going to listen to excuses anymore, whether you're young or a woman. And, and it's about just taking action. It's about to, it's about 
um, stamping your authority. It's about being clear about what you want, how you want it done, what are your expectations and, and, and um, what are your non-negotiables and just to make sure that um, you're, not going to, you're not going to negotiate it. I wanna end by saying, um, and share some words from Mac, uh, Madeline Albright. And she said, and I quote, it took me quite a long time to develop a voice. And now that I have it, I'm not going to be silent. Thank you.